Uh, first and foremost, um, the session is being recorded. So if you do have questions, you can always come back and watch the session. Uh, you can find it on the GetCoin Media page on YouTube. There's a playlist that's called Greenhouse Hacks 2, and it has this session and all the other sessions listed there. Uh, second of all, if you do have questions, throw them in the chat or the QA. Uh, I'll make sure that your questions get answered. Um, and then last but not least is in the chat, feel free to say hi. Let us know where you're watching from and what you're working on. It's a good way for us to get to know y'all and for y'all to get to know one another. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Nicholas. And Nicholas, you can get started. Great. Thank you, Gloria. So hello, everyone. My name, uh, as Gloria said, is Nicholas Stanford. I am the Developer Experience Lead at Reach. And hopefully you were with us yesterday and you were able to walk through the what is Reach presentation and then a, a short example on the scaffolding and a little bit on the structure. But today I want to actually build a full scale application. I want to build uh, an NFT auction app in Reach live for you right here. Um, and it should take me no more than about 60 minutes. Um, I think I could probably even get through it faster, but with proper explaining, maybe about 60 minutes. So let's go ahead and get started. So let me share my screen. I'll bring up my, my code window here. Uh, again, we recommend VS Code when building with Reach. Uh, Reach has a custom VS Code extension. So if you come in here and you go down to extensions, uh, maybe it's at the top there. Oh, there it is right at the bottom, Reach IDE. So this will actually help you get that syntax sugar on your programs or uh, in your RSH files. Uh, and we really recommend using VS Code. But before you actually start programming, it's really good to think about what, what exactly is the problem that you're solving, right? You wanna start with like a problem analysis. What, what problem are we solving? So uh, if we're gonna build like an NFT auction, all right, it's gonna involve uh, someone who creates the application, establishes the sale, and then it's going to have buyers who bid on the NFT, right? And if the bid is successful, the app will hold on to the, the tokens, hold on to the algos, right? And then we'll only allow bidding while, while the auction is active, right? We'll set some, some type of time length, some type of time delta for us uh, to, to let the auction run for a specified amount of time, right? At the end of the auction, the highest bidder receives the NFT and the contract transfers the funds back to the creator. So in our problem analysis, what problem is this step actually going to solve, right? So collectors of NFTs, they want uh, a secondary marketplace, right? To sell their assets and, and buyers desire to, to purchase NFTs um, that were maybe previously not available, right? Second, the seller must be able to create a new auction for each piece of artwork. This is an interesting point that I think it's important to talk more about because it's I think it's a common misconception when you come from web two and go into web three uh, you think that the like the smart contract is this large uh, entire sort of platform scope but really what we're doing is we're creating an instance of the contract to run one time so you'll have one contract per one nft and then when the user goes to or the the seller goes to list another NFT, that will be housed in a separate contract altogether. It's an important point. It's a small point, but an important point. So the third is that the NFT must actually be held by the contract after the auction begins. If you were with us yesterday, you remember I said that accounts, that smart contracts have accounts, they have addresses, they can store value. And we do this because it actually makes it so that the app is more trustworthy, we can deposit the NFT into the contract and then let it run and execute the code until we are actually ready to release that NFT to the winner. That, that's also an important point. So the, the next step is like, for, okay, so each bid that comes in, if it's going to be the new bid, it needs to be higher than the older one. And then we'll actually take those tokens from that user as well. So now the contract will hold one NFT and the highest bid. And now in this case, we're comfortable with our trust in the app because it executes the code. 
It executes the code that we're aware of what it does. Both parties have deposited their assets into the contract. This is important for the trust aspect. So at the end of a successful auction, what, what is our contract going to do? It's going to send the NFT to the highest bidder, and it's going to send the highest bid back to the seller. All right? So let's get started actually looking at and creating our project here. So uh, I think yesterday we called it green. So today let's let's call it green two. So we'll say make it green two. That's going to create us a folder that we can then change directory into green two. And now we're going to create the the basic reach files that you need. Uh, so touch index dot rsh is your backend reach file. Touch index dot njs is your front end JavaScript file. Okay, we've created both those files. Let's go in here and grab them. Green two. So we want to grab both of these files. We'll close this out so we can see. Okay. So now we need to actually look at the scaffolding. What what needs to be in every reach application? If you were with us yesterday, you know it starts out with reach 0.1. And this is just so we notify, hey, what reach, what version are we using? And the next piece of scaffolding that's very important is the actual export of the main application. So we say export const main equals a reach app. And then we put all of our actions in here, right? This is the body. So we'll then actually start creating our data definitions. This should be the first step in your programs. After you've done your problem analysis, you start thinking to yourself, who is interacting with this contract and how are they interacting? And then what data do they need? So in our application, we said that, you know, this is an NFT auction. We said that there's two types of people, right? There's a, the creator, so we'll call them const creator and reach is an immutable language. So we, we use constants for nearly everything. We say, okay, Give me a participant, let's store that in a const called creator, and then let's give them an identifier that we're also going to call creator. So if, if we have another, a second, we have a second participant, right? We have a second user, and this user is gonna buy or bid on the NFT, we'll call them the bidder. And we'll say the bidder is an API. APIs are important in reach. This API part, um, member, right? This API user here. It's important because creator here will allow one address to be binded to the creator participant. One address. That's it. API will allow an unlimited number of addresses to contact any functions given inside of here. When I say unlimited, if your contract has logic that limits the number, of course, that is the limit. But in theory, when you create APIs where your users can come in and interact with your contract, the functionality of the API is such that it's an unlimited number of participants. So what actual data do they need? So uh, most, most programs start with some type of get, like some type of go get me the initial information. Okay, so if the creator is going to provide the contract with some initial information, let's call it get sale. And this is the definition. This is just the function signature. So we say get sale as a function. It takes in no arguments. And we're going to let it return an object as long as we spell it right. And this object is going to hold the information for the NFT. It's going to have a couple different pieces, but it's all going to come over at once. So let's just bring it over in an object. So if we say uh, one of the first pieces, we'll say the actual NFT ID, and that's going to be a token type. As long as reach doesn't correct me, it's going to be a token. Type. Type. Token is a special type in reach, and it represents exactly what you think it does. Um, reach supports not unnetworked tokens uh, natively, so that's algos. You don't have to specify if something is going to be an algos. You can just send it. But if you're going to use some other non-network token, like an ASA or an NFT, you need to declare it as a token type. So again, with the spelling, uh, forgive me, it's early here where I'm at. But then we're also going to use our time delta here, and we're going to call that length and blocks. And that's going to give us how long we want the user to actually have the auction live for. So now we've got our get sale, our initial function uh, that's going to bring that information over. 
And then we're going to need to notify the application that we are ready. So let's say auction ready is a function that takes in no argument and it returns a null value. And then we need a couple other like helper functions. We need to be able to see a few things as they happen. So the user would probably want to, the creator that is, would probably want to see the bid. Right? They want to see what, what bid just came in. And this is going to take in a couple arguments. It's going to take in an address so that we can say who gave that bid. And then it's also going to take in an unsigned integer so that we can know exactly what that number was. And then the last one we want to see is the outcome of the application. We want to see what happens at the end of it. So we'll see they show outcome as a function that also takes in an address and a UN. And you notice I'm only doing the function signatures again here. We will define the functionality of these actual functions in our front end JavaScript file. So now we've got everything that we need here for the creator. I think that's all the data we have that we need. That's all the data definitions. So now what is the bidder actually going to need to do? If one user is the bidder or, or you know, we have a collection of users who are the bidder, what function do they need to be able to do? They just need to be able to bid, right? They need to be able to put in some amount and see if it, it wins the bid. So we're just going to call this bid. And this is a function. It takes in an unsigned integer. And then it can return a tuple with an address and the UN. And I'll show you why here in a little bit. But then the next step for us is to actually initialize our application. So if you were with us yesterday, uh, this is the first sort of step into my program and start working through the steps. Right? These are data definitions. There's no, there's nothing actually happening here other than the declaration of what we're we're going to use. So there's those are our data definitions. So then we go to line 17 here and we say init, where init tells Reach start the application. We're going to start stepping through, right? So now let's go over into our uh, front end file and we could start building out what our front end file looks like. So we've got our data definitions. Let's jump back over into the MJS. Remember MJS is front end, uh, modified JavaScript, sometimes magic JavaScript, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so let's, let's start working on actually building out the data definitions and some of the front end. So, the first thing we need to do here is imports. We need to have a couple imports. We need to load the standard library from reach. So we say load standard library and then reach go ahead and gives us uh, the location of that. And then we want to import everything as back end from the build folder. Uh, I've said this a few times now, but it was a good session yesterday. So I'll say again, if you were with us yesterday, um, this right here, this is where you're at actual RSH file compiles to. So if you go to your RSH file and then you come down here and you run reach compile, and I can actually get this out of the way for us here. I apologize about that. Um, you can actually run reach compile and it'll compile into a folder in here. And maybe I'll, I'll grab the one from yesterday just to show you. You see build, it'll compile down into the build folder. There's a lot of other files here from my demonstration yesterday, but here's the index.main.mjs. This is the compiled output from your RSH file. So what we're doing is we're importing everything. We're calling it backend from this file location. All right, and then we're gonna add, we're gonna create like a little helper constant for load standard library so that we don't have to reference it like that. And the next thing we wanna do maybe is like create a new account. So we'll say account creator, and this is a standard library helper function that is only allowed in test environments, but it's really useful for us here right now. And it takes in a number. It takes in some number. So if I wanted to say it takes in 100, I can't say that. The algorithm network deals in micro algos. So I can't just say 100. It'll parse that down to micro algos, and I won't hardly have any. So how do we deal with that? So what if we created a starting balance constant? So let's say, uh, you know, instead of 100, we're going to move it and say starting balance. But then up here, we're going to say the starting balance is standard library parse currency 100. Okay. And now this, 
This is going to take 100. You, the programmer, speaks algos. The network deals in micro algos. You don't want to have to get your calculator out every time you want to input 100. So you put 100 into the standard library parse currency function, and it sends it down to the network uh, micro algos. So we've got our starting balance. So we've got a new test account. Um, let's create a little console log here just to tell us what's happening. Everything that we are doing here today is going to run completely automated. Uh, there are some, some different things we could do to make it interactive so that our user could come in and say, OK, I want to bid this much. And that's how you would build a real application. But our test applications run a lot faster and more efficiently when we automate our tests. So today, everything I'm going to do is going to be automated. So you'll see me drop some console log statements. Just to make sure uh, that things that, that when the program runs, I'm seeing the output and I know what the, the program is doing. So we've got our new test account. And I th think the next thing we should do is actually cr create the NFT. The, the actual standard library, the standard library has an actual uh, launch token function that allows us to create an NFT easily. So we'll say console.log and not just an NFT, um, it allows us to create. Any, any sort of uh, ASA token with any amount of tokens, but then to specify an NFT, you just make it one. It's just supply of one, and now it's one non-fungible token, right? Const, and we'll call it the NFT. And this, <clears throat> this is the actual language we're gonna use for creating it, right? So we'll await, again, we'll await the standard library to launch token. And launch token takes in a couple arguments. The first one is, who is launching this token? And we're going to say the account creator is launching this token. Uh, let's call it uh, anything you want. Here's another identifier, the name. You see this pops up here. You get account, any, name, string, and then symbol. So what if we call it Mona Lisa? That's the name of it. Well, we're not, not copyright infringing. Who knows? Okay, and then we'll use NFT as the tag. So you know that's the symbol for it, right? You're familiar with uh, token symbols. It's usually the three-letter identifier, three, four-letter identifier um, that, that goes along with that token. So we're going to say it's an NFT. And the last thing we need to do is specify the supply. See, it's a supply. Supply, how many? We're going to say one. We only want one. So I think that's everything I need to create the NFT. So now it'll create the NFT for me with that launch token. and It'll store it all in that constant called the NFT. OK, but the NFT has different properties. So let's go in here and say, OK, now NFT ID is equal to the NFT dot ID. And that'll return the ID for us and store it inside that constant. And the next thing we need to do is declare what our minimum bid is going to be allowed. So we'll say constant in bid is equal to the standard library. Again, if we wanted to say two, we can't say that. We need to say parse currency and send it that way. Otherwise, you'll get two microalgos, and I don't think you could buy anything for two microalgos. I don't, I don't even think you could make a transaction for two microalgos. So <clears throat> we've got our minimum bid now. We've parsed it down into two algos. Let's give it the length. How long are we going to allow this thing to run for? Remember, our time delta was referenced in length and blocks. And why don't we have to parse this currency? Well, because it's not currency. It's just a, a number. It's a 10 blocks. We don't want to parse that down and say 10 micro algo blocks. That'll run very, very fast. So here's our length in blocks. And then we're going to set that actual parameter object. So we're going to say const the params. And then here is our, our syntax for referencing and setting that object. So we'll say min bid length in blocks. Right here's all of those pieces that we've specified uh, so that we can send those parameters to the back end. Right, we said that back here, this first get sale function is actually going to return an object that has NFT ID, min bid, length, and blocks. So here we've specified NFT ID, min bid, length, and blocks, and then stored it in an object called params. So when we're ready, we can just pass the parameters back. It's no problem. So uh, we're, we're going to define a little bit more about the creator. We're going to define a little bit more about uh, the front end interaction here. So I'm going to add some lines and just some space here for me to, to work a little bit further down. I know I'm going to add a lot of material here to the middle. So I want to jump down here just a bit. 
So first thing we're going to do is actually uh, allow the creator to deploy the application. So how do we do that? Well, we need to, as usual, store something in a constant. And the CTC creator is going to hold that unique information between the account and the contract. So it'll say CTC creator equals the account from the creator and then the reach function contract and then back end. Why back end? Again, because up here at the top, we that's how we specified how we were going to reference our file, our back end file. So now anytime we want to reference that, we just need to call it back end. So it's saying, okay, go get the back end and then attach it to this uh, contract, attach this account to that contract, store that unique information in CTC creator. So now we have CTC creator in there. And then we need to actually move the automation, uh, create the functionality and move the automation forward. So how will we do that? Well, we, we wrap it all in an await. We say ctc.creator dot participants right because that's what this user is and then we sit, we reference them how did how did we tag them we, we we gave them a creator tag right so here is that await oh, all right so everything in here is going to be the functionality for our creator and what did we say the creator needed to do here is the functionality we need to define now these are the function signatures, and these need to mirror the front end. We need the front end to mirror what's going on here in the back end. So we need a function called get sale. It needs to take no arguments, and it needs to return an object. So let's go back to the front end, and let's define that. So we said it was called get sale. It takes in no arguments. And then what is get sale actually going to do? Well. Uh, we said that it needs to return the parameter object. So we've set the parameter object up here again in, in with those um, three identifiers, right? We've set the parameter object. So we're going to return that. And then also because this is running automated, I want to log that this is happening. We got to this point in our program, and I'll know that just by looking at the output. So we'll say they set the parameters of the sale. And then we're actually going to pass the parameter object in so that it logs to the console. And we can see what those settings were. So we'll return the parameters. And then what was the next one? Remember, we have to match everything. So the next one was au auction ready. So let's build auction ready. Auction ready took in no arguments. And what did auction what does auction ready actually do? Well, this is just allowing us from the back end to invoke some action on the front end. It's allowing the back end to work through a few steps and then say, we're ready for the next piece. And then the auction ready will be triggered and something will happen. So for us, that something is that we're going to start the bidders. And I have not defined this function yet, but I will uh, here in the future. So don't get too hung up there. The next thing that we had was the two functions for the, the creator to see that something actually happened. So the first one was cbid. And it took in an address that we're going to reference as who and then amount. Now these variables are locally scoped. These inputs are locally scoped. So you can call them whatever you want. Um, I like to try to keep the naming conventions close so that you know what the thing is that's coming in. You don't have to constantly go back and forth and say, oh, what is that? Right. So cbid, it takes in a user, it takes in an address and the amount that that user bid. The only thing we want to do here is show what, what happened. So we'll say console.log creator, again with the spelling, creator saw that and then we'll this is the syntax here to add some variable into your string right so you're going to output this console log string uh, and then in here you need to actually uh, allow some input to come in and be represented so how do we do that we say standard library i mean i mean usually you would just you know give it the variable right so here's the variable we want to say who but this is going to come over um in not a nice format, right? If we want to format our address, we need to say standard library dot format address. And now it'll bring this who identify this person that we're calling who, and then format into the address that you're familiar with on the Algorand network so that it, it spits out all of the alphanumeric, le uh, alphanumeric letters and, and, and numbers for the address string. So here's format address. 
And what did they do? They bid some number. So then we'll do the same thing, but this time we'll say uh, that they bid an amount, right? But remember, the network deals in microalgos. So if we leave this here, this is going to output microalgos. If we have parse currency to go from algos down, we also have a function to go from microalgos back up. So that function is standard library dot format currency. And now it'll it takes in microalgos and it outputs algos. So those are a couple of the helper functions that just make it easier on you uh, to write programs in reach. So here is CBID. And the last one that we actually want to add is, is called show outcome. So show outcome is going to show us who the winner was. And it's going to show the amount as well. So we just want another console log statement here. And we want to say that the creator saw that. And again, we have an address coming over, like a, a, an unformatted address. Let's format it. So let's say standard library dot format address. And this time we called it winner. And what did they do? They won with, and then we're going to output uh, another set of currency, right? We're going to output some more currency. So we want to format currency and then give it that, that variable, that locally scoped variable and say, okay, that's amount. That's what we're going to give it. Excellent. So now we have um, the participant interact interface, the interact objects. So this is the participant interact interface, right? This is what functions and data this participant is allowed to use. And then this is what functions and data this participant is allowed to use. And now in the front end, we've defined what the interact object is. What is it doing? Here's the functionality. It's logging things to the console. It's returning things back to the back end, right? That's how we, we think about that. So the, all the initial data points have been defined and we're gonna move on to communication construction. How do our users actually input that information into the application, right? How, how do we actually allow these participants to communicate with our smart contract? So let's uh, roll down here into our RSH file. And let's start building out some of the communication construction. So the first thing we said is that the, the app starts with some type of like informational upload. We, we need to teach the contract some set of information. Who does that? Well, the creator does that. So we're going to come down here and say creator only. And this will move us into a local step, which is just the user input some information at their keyboard. At their keyboard, they're telling us what is the NFT ID, they're telling us what is the minimum bid, and they're telling us what is the length of blocks. So we need to bring the, that information over into its own constant. So we're saying NFT ID, min bid, and length in blocks. And typically what we would want to do is just reference that function, right? We want to say get sale, give me that function. But this lives in the front end. Remember? the functionality is here there, it's not scoped for you to just say get sale so you need to say interact with that, that front end function that i'm calling get sale and the last piece of this is that it comes over hat so you need to unhash that return value so that we can actually see what's underneath of there so now we've returned the parameters from the front end from the users inputted those parameters for us and now we're ready to actually publish this information in a local step, it's between the user and their computer. But we want to write that information to the blockchain. So what we say is, give me the information and then publish it to the blockchain. So we've got creator.publish. And this is, uh, this is a consensus operation. So the user's wallet is going to pop up here and ask them, do you approve this transaction? Because it's going to cost that standard network fee of 0 0.001 algos. So, uh, we'll, we'll publish that information. All right, we're going to set our own amount here. We're going to say there is just one. Oops, let's forget our equal sign. There is just one. And then we're going to commit. What is commit? Commit is us moving out of consensus back to a regular state of our program. 
the regular state of our program can be designed in many different ways. We can have a lot of different states that move between consensus and local and back and forth. Uh, commit is our way of saying, I'm done with all of my consensus operations, please move on. So we'll come out of our consensus and then we'll go back into uh, our creator action. So the creator is actually gonna pay how much amount and what are they paying NFT ID? So if you've seen any reach programs before, uh, maybe you've seen something like this where it's like creator.pay uh, amount. The difference here is that this is this argument is for network tokens. If you were trying to pay algos, that's what the argument looks like. But if you're trying to pay non-network tokens, NFTs, ASAs, you need to have what, we're, what we refer to as a syntactic tuple of tokens. So you see the two brackets we have here. This is the, the common syntax in reach for paying some amount of non-network tokens. It's a big difference. Network tokens are algos, non-network tokens are ASAs and NFTs. So we, we specify, I want to pay this amount of this specific token. And that's how we differentiate between non-network tokens and network to tokens in this pay uh, function and in, in the, the arguments of this pay function. So now the creator has given us the information, they've published the information to the blockchain, and they've paid their NFT into the contract. So the next thing for us was that auction ready, right? We're, we're ready. So we want to say creator dot, uh, I apologize. If you would usually just say auction ready, but we're going to say interact dot auction ready. So this is actually going to return nothing. Remember auction ready right here returns null. So this is just shorthand for this. Right? It's the same thing as saying creator.only and then building all, all this out and then coming in here and saying uh, interact dot auction ready. It's the same thing. Why do we allow it this way? This returns a null value. You're not storing any value here. You're invoking some action. So uh, the difference up here is that this function is returning some value and we're grabbing that, we're storing it. This function returns null. So we allow a shorthand here for you to cut this out, cut all this out, cut the only out, and then just say interact at auction ready. So that's the difference there. So just a little shorthand to help make it a little easier to, to write code. So now the auction is ready. We paid the amount in the contract. We published our information to the blockchain. And at this point, we're ready to start accepting bids. But if we have an unlimited amount of users who could bid, this introduces uh, an interesting aspect in reach. And it's a race. Who is publishing this specific piece of information? Right? We could create some type of looping structure where the loop continues until the bid is over. Right? We, we, but it would have different forks depending on who wins the race. All right? So I'm already picturing a lot of different logic here, a lot of different branches and how I would how I would explore for each branch depending on who won the race. But reach comes with a, a key abstraction in this area because it's a common piece of blockchain programming. And we call it parallel reduce. The, the parallel reduce name comes from the fact that these participants are trying to, to, they're trying to produce a new state from all of the current values at the same time in parallel. They're all trying to produce some new state. So it's basically a fork and a case loop. So while Alice is, is trying to produce that new state, Bob might also be producing some other state. 
and reach needs to determine who tried to update the state first and then depending on who won execute some specific logic okay that's, that's a lot of words but let, let me show you what it actually looks like so the first thing we're going to do is specify that time delta the end of our the end of our auction right so we had length and blocks so you you could just use 10 as a length and blocks, but we need to tell Reach, we, we need to tell the smart contract uh, instead, what time is it? It doesn't know what time it is. When, when you create your smart contract out of thin air, it doesn't know what time it is. So you need to teach it, what time is it? So you say the end is last consensus time. And this, this is a helper function in Reach that'll go get the last consensus time on the network. And then you add the length and blocks to that. So what have you just done? You've created some time out in the future that's 10 blocks ahead of this consensus time. So that's what we'll use to end our, our auction. Now, we're actually going to start to define our parallel reduce. So we'll say, what are the variables that are going to change? What variables constantly need to be updated by all these different people? OK. So we have the highest bidder. This will change depending on who bids, right? We have the last price that was bid. And then we have a Boolean for like, is this the first bid? Because we have some special action that we need to do if this is the first bid. And then we have uh, our parallel reduce. So we say parallel reduce. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Seems the uh, helper there did a little too much for me. So we say equals parallel reduce. And what is on this parallel reduce side? They, these are the actual initial values for those variables. So what do I mean? I mean, creator is set to highest bidder. Min bid is set to last price. And true is set to is, is for is first bid. So this is what the actual declaration of a parallel reduce looks like. Now, uh, just to clean up a little bit, I want to sort of format this for a way that I'm a little more, more familiar with. So it'll say like this. So we have our three variables, and then we have their initial values here. Okay. But then after that, we actually need to input. We actually need to input what's going to happen. So one of the the cases, or one of the things that, that the parallel reduce We'll have you do is specify a while loop. Remember, this is a an abstraction of a while loop. So this is a looping structure. So we'll say while and then give it some condition. So we've already got some time out in the future set for n. So right when we get to this point, let's grab the time again and then say okay, okay until this time gets to n. So we'll say while uh, again we'll reference last consensus this time. And while that's less than or equal to n, right? So now it's grabbing our current point in time and running until we get to that point in the future that we've specified. So that is our while condition. That's when the, the loop will actually break. OK, a few other things that we need to notify here. What is not going to change in our program? We need to know this. Reach has this special feature for verification checks. We call it the invariant. What is an invariant? It's something that never changes. The condition inside the invariant never changes before, during, or after the loop. At all three of those points, this condition is upheld. It's maintained. Uh, so what, what is something that's not going to change? Well, we've paid the NFT into the contract. So if we were to say that the balance of the contract holds an NFT ID equal to what our specified amount, this is saying this will not change before, during, or after the execution of my loop. And it won't because we're not going to transfer anything to users inside of the loop. So the next one we're going to say is dot invariant that the balance 
And now this, because the, the, the argument of balance there is empty, it's going to refer to network tokens. How many algos are in the contract? Balance equals, and there's a little ternary here for us to look at. So this is part of why we have is first bid. So we have this Boolean that says, is this the first bid? If yes, the balance should be zero. If no, the balance should be whatever the last price was. Right? It's just a ternary operator. Is this expression true? If yes, give me the first thing. If no, give me the second thing. So that is uh, like the, the structure of what our actual uh, uh, parallel reduce looks like. What, what are the bones of our parallel reduce? Uh, and the next thing I think we need to do is actually start to to call our bidder API. So if we have you know, we have this API up here, right? We called it bidder, and it has this bid function. How do we specify that call inside of a parallel reduce? We say API, and then we reference the API. What did we call it? We called it bidder, and then we reference the function. We called it bid. Right? It takes in one argument, call it bid there, and then it's going to do some things. And this is our API syntax. Uh, so the, the API underscore there, we refer to that as API macro, right? It's a special macro of a standard API, and a standard API is specified this way. But we'll be using the macro. So one advantage of this macro is that it allows reach developers to write less code, right? There's less opportunity for you to introduce bugs. It's a quick indication that the dynamic assertions will not change between our two steps. Right, there's a lot there, but I'll show you what that looks like. So we're going to come down here to line 39. We're going to skip one, so I can show you what that check looks like a little bit later. So oh, we'll come down here to line 39, and we're going to actually start to define the meat of what this API does. So we need to wrap it inside of a return. And this first argument is going to be what the user pays. This is a pay expression. The user pays this amount. Um, the abstraction of the parallel reduce is such that all of that functionality is squashed down inside of this return. So it'll say, pay that amount, whatever's come in here. Notify is our return function. I'll show you that here in a second. Notify is our return function. What do I mean by that? Well, this API with the name bid that takes in one input, but it also has an output. See, bid takes in one input, that's what we call bid there, and then it outputs a tuple. So we need to return a tuple. So how do we do that? We create this necessary return function. You must specify some return function. You can call this whatever you want. Sometimes you call it just return. Maybe that's easier, just call it return. And then you come in here and you say, call the return function. And then send the return values. In this case, it's going to be whatever the value currently is for highest bidder, and then the, the value for last price. So this has the address for the highest bidder. This has the uint for the price. So there's our tuple. There's the return of our tuple. If you were to change that to anything else, reach will yell at you and say, hey, that's not the right one. OK, so now the logic. What is actually going to happen? If this is not first bid, what do I want you to do? If not first bid, transfer the last price to the highest bidder. And then we need to set who, <clears throat> excuse me, this as a, a pointer in reach or an identifier in reach refers to the caller. Who's calling this API? Give me their address. That's what this refers to. So we've said that this API can be called by any number 
number of users, any unspecified number of users, we don't care who it is. But when they come in, we need to grab that address. So this refers to who it is. And the next thing we want to do is invoke that C bid function so that the user here can actually, or the creator can actually see who to what. So we say creator.interact. This is just that shorthand for local step. C bid, who bid, right? There's your address and there's your UN. Now, the last thing we need to do is update our return values. At each iteration, this value, these values must be up updated or upheld. So this, this is the only opportunity you have to change those variables. Right here, we say return, and then we, we give it each one of these three. What is the new value for that? So for right, right now, it's who, then it's bid, and then it's false. So now, each one of, you know, initially, we set it to these, but then we're going to update it to these. Right? This is how we update variables through our parallel reduced statements. Now, now one of the, the other pieces here is going to be the actual timeout. What happens if a user never responds? If we prompt them, if their wallet interface comes up and they never respond, what do we do? That would stall the application forever. The creators in it would be stuck in the contract. We couldn't do anything with it. We don't want to allow that. So reach comes with timeout functions. So underneath our API, we're going to say dot timeout. And this will apply to any one of the argument or any one of the functions that's declared inside of this parallel reduce. Absolute time. And right, we're going to pass it in that end value. We've reached it. And now, what do we actually want to happen in here? We need to have a pause. Publish. We need to have a publish or reach yellow. So creator needs to publish. And now we just want to return our updated values. Again, these are going to correlate to these three variables that we constantly are updating throughout our loop. Highest bidder, last price is first bid. And now that will return and update each one of those values if we hit this time, if we hit this time out. Okay. So line 52 here closes that timeout. That's great. I'd like to see what this error is yelling at me. There's an error somewhere. Yeah, OK, I'm not ready to exit. So that's not a big error. But basically, what Reach is telling me is that um, there needs to be an exit at the end of every one of your files. It needs to say, just destroy this application. But to do so, we must be in a certain step. So if we get at that, it, it should stop yelling at me. Just those red squiggly lines as the enemy of a programmer, I swear. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so we've got our commit, our exit, and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. But now let's go back to our front end. So the actual stepping through of our program is ready. We have the NFT in the contract. We've 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 said auction ready, and then we've had our bidders. Uh, we've defined what they're allowed to do. They can come in here and and invoke this bid function. They can come in here put in one parameter and be returned this right here, which is that tuple address UN. So if we're going to go back to our front end logic, remember that the MJS file. We'll come back up here where we left off. And let's move on to actually sort of creating that, that start bidders. Remember, start bidders is how we actually run our program. So the back end is going to hit that auction ready portion and then that's going to jump to the front end and run auction ready so we jump to the front end we go down to auction ready and it runs this function called start bidders so now we're going to come up here and define what is start bidders and what does it actually do so we'll create a variable for done and we're in the mjs file now we're in the front end this is not specific reach code the reach standard library is specific to reach but you're allowed to use variables a lot uh, and, and many things in here that you're not allowed to use in reach program. So we'll say const bidders, and we'll just set them as an empty array. This is something you can't do in reach, right? All arrays need to be static and defined at, at initialization, right? Um, but it's not a requirement in JavaScript. So we'll uh, define that constant or, or, or that variable to, to get us a, a done value when we're ready for it, and we'll also define that array that lets us know 
uh, who our bidders are. And we'll, we'll push each one of those bidders onto that. So the next thing we're going to do is actually create that start bidders function. So we said start bidders, and, and I believe it, it needs to be async. So we'll say async, we'll spell it correctly. The backspace is my favorite key, I swear. So async, and then we'll pass in and we'll actually get our function started here. So here's what our start bidders looks like. Okay, next, uh, let's actually create that variable for the bid. And it'll say um, this, this bid is equal to that min bid and allow us to update that later. So the next thing we do is actually start to run our bidders. And this is, again, this is all because of automation. Um, many of this, these things would just be like interactive functions that would allow a user to come in and say, hey, I'm here. Let's start the interaction. Um, but our testing suites, it's really nice to make things automated and they just kind of output and we can see exactly what we're going for. Okay, so we have run bidder and we need to create like a random amount for incrementing. Again, just a test thing. So let's create a random increment for our bids, right? We'll parse currency. And then we'll say math.random. Give me a number between zero and nine. And then we'll say bid is equal to bid.add. And then we'll add that increment. So that'll allow us to actually update that, that bid. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is actually start to create some test account. Each time we run this, it'll, it'll create this test account. So we'll say, generally speaking, let's call, call it account. And that equals await the standard library, create a new test account, and give it the starting balance. Remember, we've already defined what starting balance is. We parsed currency down. And then we're going to set a debug label. And this is just for us to see uh, some extra output that's specific to who is calling. And then we need to await. And if you've been interacting with the Algorand network for any uh, amount of time, this function should seem familiar. Why? Because we need to opt in to our ASAs on Algorand. If it's not the Algo token, you're welcome. All it needs to opt into that. This is a helper function that says token accept this ID and opt in into that for our user. And then we're going to push onto our bidders array. And we're going to say array for bidders dot push. Right, and we're going to give it the address and the account. So now the, the bidders array should hold who and the address. And the next thing we need to do is a little bit of contract attachment. Remember, if we have down here, we have like this user, this is the creator, right? So we need to do the same thing, but for uh, an API user. So how do we do that? We say const CTC, and then this is just general, right? So, you know, could be like CTC API or whatever, but we'll just say CTC because it's going to update with each different user. So we'll say account.contract the same way. But the difference here is that it's going to accept two arguments. Now it's going to accept the back end that we defined, but then we're also going to specify that this is the contract we want, not just any instance of this contract. So we need to say CTC creator. We need to say CTC creator dot get info. And now that'll tell uh, Reach that use this backend contract specific to this other user. And then store that, that specific information inside CTC. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is create a, a helper function that's just going to get us the balance. It's an async. We're going to format currency here. What are we doing? Uh, we're going to get the balance of the account. So reach has a helper function here that will allow this is use balance of, and then just pass in the account that you need. And it'll, it'll output the amount of currency. And then you need to format that for you to, to actually be able to read um, instead of being in micro units. So we're getting there. We're, we're uh, line 30 on the uh, front end there. It says that get balance, that helper function. So let's keep working through and, and let's get a couple of uh, console log statements here that just show us what's happening. There's a lot going on so far. So let's say console.log, we'll say 
who, oops, don't forget your curly braces. I had a professor once who called that a Nance, and I've never heard it again. So if anybody like has a software engineering degree and is guaranteeing me that's what it's called, please let me know. <laughs> Otherwise, shout out to uh, Mr. K, who called it a Nance, and I've never heard it called that again. So who decides to bid? And now we need to say what they're bidding. Standard library dot format currency, because if we're going to send the bid, right, it's going to be an amount. We, we want to see it. We want to see it in regular currency. And then I'll add, uh, I'll add another log down here below it. That's going to tell us uh, the balance of the user's account. Right? We use this, this helper function on line 30. So we'll say console.log. And again, we'll say who uh, balance before is. And then we'll call that get balance function. So now that should grab that balance and log it for us. Each user will see what their balance looks like. Okay, so we have the start bidder logic, right? We have, uh, we've created the general account, we funded it with some tokens, uh, and then we've logged some information to the console. So what's the next thing that we wanna do? We want to, assert things about our program. Now, now, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the verification engine, but it's one of the most powerful pieces of reach. It allows you, the programmer, to prove any assumptions you have about your program. If you have experience in programming, you can know what I'm talking about. You write this function, and you think it works some way, so you write a lot of test cases, and you test all of the possible inputs, you test all the possible outputs, and when you think Think you've got it all you say okay i think it's good maybe you've even got a piece of scratch paper out and you've written down all the possibilities for inputs and then you, you test every one of them and you're checking them off the list nope not possible not, not oh, that's good that's good right what if we just wanted to reach to check all that for us what if we just want to guarantee what we assume is true about our program and we want to lean on reach to do that we can't that is one of the most powerful features of reach these assertions can be static or they can be dynamic. Static assertions use assert, and they're always true throughout the life of the application. Dynamic assertions may vary in truthfulness based on the state of the application, but these dynamic assertions in a local step would use assume and a require in a, in a consensus step. So assume in a local step, require in consensus. But what if what if you don't want to have to remember that? Well, reach has a, a helper function there too. So we remove that. And now you can just use check. And check will break down to whatever you need depending on where you need it. So let's actually see what these look like. So I'll go back to my RSH file. Okay, and I've left, I've left some lines empty here. And this was on purpose. Uh, I want to assert something about my program. I want to I want to tell Reach, hey, this is a rule and it must be true. So what am I going to assert? I'm going to assert. And good things to assert about your program are balances. Right? What, what about the balance of the NFT? Like, what if I assert the balance of the contract uh, referencing the NFT is always equal to the amount? If not, give me this error message. Balance of NFT is wrong. So what this is gonna do is guarantee that the balance of the NFT ID equals the amount. If not, here is the error message that you will receive and you'll likely just receive that at compile time. It'll tell you balance of NFT is wrong. And then you know specifically what line in your program you need to go look at. So there's that, a stat, that, that static assertion here on line number 27. Now we come down here to the other line I left open, line 38. And line 38 is that check, right? This will break down to whatever you need. And we're gonna check that the bid is greater than the last price. If not, bid is too low. And that's our dynamic assertion. 
right? It'll break down based on what you need, like depending on where you are in your program. So those are the two key assertions I wanted to look at here in this program. But now let's go back to the front end and let's continue on with, with our communication construction and with actually running our bidders here. So we're gonna, create, we're gonna implement a try-catch block. If you're not familiar, try will attempt to run this uh, code. If some error is present, it will catch that error and then run that other block, right? Okay, so let's actually start our try block here. We'll say try. And then what are we trying? Well, we want to try the bid, right? We want to try to actually bid. And then if there's some error, we want to catch that. So let's say uh, last bidder and then last bid. And that is await ctc.apis.bidder.bid. Now, then we pass in what the actual bid is. So we use that CTC, that unique contract information. And then we say, go to the API. Which APIs? The bidder. APIs. Okay, what's the function called? It's called bid. And then what does it take? It takes one argument that's an EID win. So what's next after that? We'll say console.log who outbid. Who did they outbid? The last bidder who bid. Right, here's just a string. Then we're going to put in standard library dot format. Uh, I believe that's currency. We'll be formatting currency for the last bit here. Last bid. Add our end of line character. Now, what, what do we want to catch? Right. Um, this is sort of. Uh, I mean, it's locally scoped, but it doesn't matter what you call that. Uh, you can call that anything you want. E is common for exception. That's what it's referred to as an exception. So console.log who failed to bid because the auction is over. And that's really the only case we would get into. If you have other cases, you would just specify what, what happened. I mean, the idea is that you, you know what are the possible options for the errors that will be thrown, and then you want to try to catch each one of those possible options. So we'll say, uh, now we'll get like another balance. We'll say who balance after is, and then we need to await our get balance function. Put it right in there like that. Okay, and then we need to await our get balance function. So that'll actually print the balance of the user. I think I'm missing, I, th I think that should be like that. I don't want to miss any of those. Is that correct? Excuse me for a second, make sure I got it right here. Yeah, that's correct, but I'm also missing a second. Yeah, I think I'm also missing a second. It's this one here. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is actually actually add some of our bidders here. So <clears throat> we want to run this bidder. We want to say, you know, await run bidder, right? And that's actually going to invoke that run bidder, add in the argument for who is calling it, await run bidder, and Bob. Always need to use Alice and Bob. And the, the third common cryptography name is Claire. Use Claire. We usually stop at two, but when you need a third, Claire is there to save the day. So while not done, this will just move us forward. We're in a DevNet and it operates a little bit differently than the testnet or anything else for that matter. So that is our try catch block. That is us invoking that await. And one of the next things we need to do is to sort of finish up in the RSH file. We need to actually transfer. If you remember, we go to the back, we, we finished up our, our loop. Right? And we didn't do anything. So we need to actually transfer. Uh, what did we say? Well, we said the winner gets the NFT, right? So let's say transfer. And this is a special operation in reach that will invoke a payment from the contract. It'll say transfer amount. 
and, and then the NFT ID where dot two the highest bidder. And then one of the last things we need to check here is it's not the is first bid. What else do we want it to do? We want to transfer the last price back to the creator, right? It's really nice with the business logic of reach. If the words I'm actually saying is what it's actually doing, right? It's very nice. So uh, let's get into the last piece here, creator, uh, where they want to see the actual outcome. So we'll show the outcome. We'll give it the highest bidder. And we'll give it the last price. And I think that is just about everything for the application. I think that's everything. Double check my code here and then we'll see if we can get it to run. We'll clean up some of this. Oh, there's one other thing we need to do. Oh yeah, we need to output some more information here at the bottom. Yep. Okay. So let's do that. So let's add this part here. So we need to come down here and just create like a simple loop. Again, we're in MJS, so looping structures are different. And we'll say const uh, who and then the account of bidders, right? So that'll iterate over our bidders array. And then it's going to do something. It's going to take the amount, the amount NFT. And it's going to grab those from the balances. And this is just for our but for a test so that we can see who has what and if the transfers worked appropriately. Okay. Who has, and again, we're going to format the currency so that we can see it in a nice output for my currency amount. And then we need to specify the standard unit. So we'll say amount, and then we'll come in and say standard unit. So standard library dot standard unit. And then we need to output the NFT. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I think just one. Excuse me. I apologize for that. Okay, so we have standard unit, and then we need to get the amount of the NFT. So we'll say amount NFT of the NFT. Turn our variable off. And I think we're ready. So we've got our backend RSH file. We've defined our data, all the data that we need. We've defined the actual communication construction. How does our user interact with the application? And then we've created our parallel reduce, which is our large looping structure. And it allows these bidders to come in and bid and update all of this information, these different variables uniquely, right? And then we, we can publish that information. And then we, we actually have a transfer pattern here at the bottom. What happens? Who gets the tokens at the end? So the Let's actually run and see uh, how this works. So we need to go into our folder. We're in uh, green two, I think I called it. Uh, the little white dots here mean that I still need to save my files. So we'll come up here and go save all. I want to reach compile first and see if I made any errors in the RSH file. Again, the uh, reach compile only checks your RSH file for errors. That's your actual reach code. And we see it checked all the knowledge assertions. Uh, all of the verification theorems have been checked and there are no failures. So we need to tell Reach what network, remember Reach is blockchain agnostic. We work on different blockchains, but if we want to tell Reach, look at Algorand, we say Reach connector mode equals algo dot slash Reach run. Now I know if there are any errors, they're likely to be JavaScript errors because I already used Reach compile to check my RSH file. So that's your Docker output. And then you've got uh, everything. Okay. Yep. That's moving a lot on me. Give me, sorry, give me a second. I'll show you what that up what is there. So, uh, okay. So it looks like I'm getting an error. Balances of is not a function, and I think I just have an S there. I think I just have an S there where I shouldn't. 
Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's just capitalized. Do you see that? I just accidentally capitalized it. So let's close that. Where's it at? It's in the MJS file. It's at the bottom. Right there. That's the one. And you can tell because it gives you the, the automatic sort of uh, autocomplete there. So let's go back into our green queue. It should know now that it, oh. <laughs> and it put me in my place. I didn't export and tell it. Uh, Algorand. You can set this in a config file so that you don't have to do this every time, but I don't usually do it when I uh, do these demonstrations. Let's see if we can get another chat. I'll script there and do a little more troubleshooting. Maybe. So what you see here is all this output. Warning, your program uses fun from faucet. Remember I said new test account only works in, um, in these DevNet environments. So new test account only works in, in this DevNet environment. So uh, this is telling us you're using standard library fun from faucet. Well, I didn't call that function, but that's called underneath new test account. So it calls new test account, and then it comes back and says, uh, fund that account with, with tokens so that we can test with it. In a real application, you're going to grab the user's default account from a window, from a browser window. So um, th this is OK for your, your functions here, for your test functions. Uh, and really, it's because we're moving the DevNet forward significantly that we, we have that error. So OK, so what's next? MJS line 7. I got another error. I'm really off it this morning. Let's see, line 70, right here. Oh, it's because I called it a MIT instead of a mount. Right? This is where we're actually grabbing those values, and then we're storing them here. And then when I tried to reference it, I had it wrong. Let's see, maybe I have another. So save your file with Control S. Let's get this back open here, and let's see if we can run it again. OK, now this time I don't want any JavaScript errors. Two is enough. Let's see what else comes out of here, other than that means it only works on reach DevNets. This is a uh, a new feature. This warning is a new feature in reach. It was just released last week. And we're working on adding a, um, it to what we call reach no warn. And it allows you to set an environment variable so that these outputs don't happen. If we weren't manually forcing blocks forward, um, we wouldn't get so many of these outputs. Uh, but let's go ahead and go back up here and see what our actual output was. So anything after node uh, right here, this is your actual output. So you see you're creating test account. We're having the creator create NFT. We're setting the parameters of the sale. And then Alice bids, we remove the amount, right? We There's the before balance, outbid this user, and then here is the balance after. So you see, we've actually taken the six tokens out of the 100 to get down here, right? And then we have a couple more bids for Bob, bid here. Claire just tries to bid, but fails because the auction is over. So that's our try catch block uh, executing. And then it shows that we didn't take any tokens from Claire because the auction was over. And then we're gonna skip all of this repetitive output. I apologize for this. I'm really looking forward to that reach no warn uh, coming out. So. Uh, uh, here's where we, we looked at. Creator saw that. And here's the address formatting we talked about. You're familiar with this format of address. This is standard on Algorand. Uh, and, and this is what that format address function does for us. So we saw that these two users bid. Uh, this second user outbid the other. And then it's going to show us who has what. So the creator saw uh, that this person won the application. right? They won the auction. And then we're actually transferring the amount away, right? We're taking tokens away from Bob and we're giving him one NFT. And we see nobody else has an NFT, right? And their balances are still where they were. So our program is operating correctly. So that is uh, an, a full-scale NFT auction built with reach. I said 60 minutes. It looks like I had 75. So um, that's it. That's That's uh, the power of building in reach, right? Uh, let's look at how many lines of code we actually have. You have 72 lines of front end code and you have 60 lines of back end code. You have 60 lines of reach code to build a full scale NFT auction that we could deploy right now. We could deploy right now. One final thing I want to show you CD, we'll go back into green too. 
And what if I say reach compile intermediate files? Intermediate files are going to be the in-between for, for reach code. Before we send it to the network, show me the rest of the code. So what does that look like? So I that's that's why I have so much output here. This is actually from yesterday. So let me get into this one. Go into that build folder. And here's all the intermediate files that it output for me. You see a lot of Solidity files. Um, and you can also see some Teal files. I guess if I extend this out a little bit more this way, you'll actually be able to see. So here you go. Here's app approval.teal and a couple of helper functions there. So let's look at what the Teal code actually looks like. So here's the difference. Right. As I'm working through this NFT auction, I'm telling you the things that need to happen. And those are the code. That's the code that I'm actually writing. Creator only. Go do this thing. Transfer this amount to this person. Well, this is the alternative. Stack based execution. Machine language. Assembly code written in stack based execution. Um, I've personally played around with this code a little bit. It's, it's challenging to write. It's one of the most challenging paradigms to write in assembly language. So this is all of the code that we did not have to write. Reach actually created this code for us. So we don't have to write teal. And you see it goes on and on and on. And we'll see how far down it actually goes. 690 lines of teal code. 60 lines of reach code. And that's why we build and reach. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please, if you have questions, you, you can drop them in the chat there or join us in the Discord channel. Uh, grab a link for that. The Discord channel, we're very active in uh, the Discord channel. I know I myself personally. So uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to help you guys out. Uh, and if you want to actually use Reach for, um, the greenhouse hacks here, we would love to mentor you. So reach out to me and I can help you out. So I'll copy that link. I'll drop it here in the chat for you. Excellent. Yeah, I don't, thank you first off, Nicholas, for going through that. That was pretty uh, astounding. That it is so simple. Um, I haven't played with reach yet, but this is really encouraging for me to try to give it a try. Um, for I don't see any questions. So for those of you who have questions, again, uh, Nicholas dropped the Discord. So that would be the best way to get in touch with them. Uh, again, there's a couple of days before we start the actual uh, Green Hats Hacks Hackathon. So um, you have some time to familiarize yourself with the tools, uh, familiarize yourself and play around with Reach. Reach out to the mentors if you need any assistance. Um, and then feel confident when you're actually starting your project. So uh, with that, I will say thank you again to you, Nicholas. And for everyone else, I'll see you tomorrow. I think tomorrow and when we're going to do a preview of what we think the um, categories are going to... Oh, actually, sorry, the preview is on Friday. Uh, tomorrow is programming with PyTeal. So that will be another deep dive from a programming perspective. Uh, and other than that, you'll be all set. So we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Gloria. Bye, Nicholas. Thanks again.